Hello everyone and welcome into the Lore Council. This is Kate and I am joined today with Keith. Hello, hi. And uh, for the first time ever, this is it's uh, joined by someone who isn't uh, Keith or Tristan. I am joined with uh, Tad Larkin from the uh, from the channel Mandalore. Hey everybody, glad to be here. Yeah, we obviously uh, yeah. If you're uh, into the like legends fandom at all you've probably known him from some of his great videos uh specifically a really really good one that i believe we we nabbed the idea and ran with it how we would write the clone wars i think that was on your captain fordo channel if i'm not mistaken yeah that's my um it's it's technically my first channel but i've been focusing on mandalore for the past almost six years now so that's kind of i've that's kind of what I assume to be my number one channel. Yeah, I know, Keith, you weren't super familiar with Tad before I gushed about his Clone Wars video. Yeah, uh, I think you mentioned it a few times before, and uh, you finally just you sent me the video again, and I, I watched it, and I was like, wow, I agree with, like, 99% of what this dude is saying. Like, like your, your views on, like, just the Clone Wars and... You know how the timeline should fit together. I was like, I've been thinking all this stuff for years. Amazing! It is, it is fantastic video. Oh, thank you. It's <laughs> it was very no. obvious that you were a fan just from the way you talked about the Clone Wars, you know, multimedia project and all that stuff. Oh yeah, I've been a long time fan since I was like seven years old. It's been an ongoing thing. Yeah, I'm, yeah, definitely same here. Um, yeah, I got into it like all the you know the young adult novels, uh, of course the movies, you know prequels. Are you a prequel uh, supporter, naysayer? You kind of mixed I'm a, bag. I'm a prequel enjoyer. Um, I understand some of the criticism some people have with the prequels, and I recognize that there are some flaws, but I enjoy them anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty much on the same page. I used to be kind of jaded and then now I'm, I'm like back around like in the prequels again the, the prequels had a well george lucas had a goal with the prequels and when you understand like what the goal was which was to set up the original trilogy i think they accomplished that in um essentially more or less the time frame given to them with the three movies yeah there's Definitely nothing li else like it in in movies and maybe just in most media. You know that what yeah what that that kind of that plot and story and just the epic scale of what he did in the prequels that was was pretty epic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the art style was great. The costumes design was great. The ILM models that they made in the um, in the workshop of all like the different ships and oh yeah, my, one of my favorite things I used to do is just watch the special features for the prequels. You just get oh, yeah. all this insider info and the, yeah, the props. It's all really cool. Well, I I had a subscription to Star Wars Insider when I was younger, so I was sitting there like every they would always have like an uh, updates for Episode Two and Episode Three, and I would sit there and I'd read and I'd see whatever photos they posted inside the the magazine. Oh, yeah, I never uh, I never got into that or heard of that magazine. Yeah, I I knew that it existed, but it was. It was one of those things I'd, I'd ask my mom when I when I was a little kid. I'm like, Mom, can I can I get the Star Wars Insider? And and you know, it's either that or or the Spider Man comics I wanted. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it was a it was a great magazine, and um, like it like I said, it gave insider info on Star Wars, and it was the best era of that magazine publication was during the prequel era because we got to see all of the behind the scenes stuff, all of like the little releases like little sneak peeks and it, it was just wonderful it was a wonderful experience and i wish i could dig all my old ones up so i can re-experience them again but i have a few lying around nice nice yeah i'm sure uh... well, it's kind of it is kind of a sort of a bygone era now you know this uh like the that you know the old school star wars juggernaut of just all the marketing and just the like toys and yeah at that time that was probably the strongest with it Mm -hmm. I was mainly introduced through the, I saw like the cartoons, uh, the the two D Clone Wars cartoons, mm -hmm. which actually were just basically meant as like an advertisement for the toys and whatnot. Yeah, they were basically commercials that 
got wicked popular, and then they gave them a bit more runtime, which was fantastic. Oh yeah, no, it was great. But uh, I suppose that's like the perfect segue uh, to head into what what when. Well, you said around seven. So what kind of more specifically like got you into Star Wars? I guess sans the movies. Yeah. Well, so uh, my dad is, you know, he, he had saw the first Star Wars when he was younger, and um, he had been casually into them. When he married my stepmom, my stepbrother was very much into them. And he, he actually had got a little bit into the expanded universe as well. But it was around then that my dad was like, okay, well, I guess it's high time that, you know, we show him the movies. And at that time, uh, episode uh, two was in production and uh, episode one had already come out. But um, we'd watched the first one and A New Hope. And I remember sitting afterwards, and he's like, what did you think? And I asked, is, is there more? Because I was very confused. I was like, where, what happened? With, you know, where's the part where Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father? And he's like, oh, no, that's not until the next one. I'm like, oh, there's more? Okay. So, yeah. It was yeah, a so whole your, experience. Your, um, your stepdad, uh, he started you off right by showing you A New Hope first? Well, my real father, my stepbrother got me a little bit into the expanded universe because he, you know, I would ask him questions. I was like, oh, does, you know, Palpatine really come back? Is like, oh, oh, does the Empire still really exist after Endor? Things oh, like that. Those, those, uh, um, so, so for me, I got the first big exposure I got into the EU was, uh, one of my buddies had, uh, the Dark Empire comics. He had them, I don't, I don't know if there was like an collected edition or what they were but i read them and i would go around like my elementary school and like oh my oh my god you guys like 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 palpatine comes back and he's like this weird naked green clone guy and oh my god and everyone's like kate kate no one cares can we please just play baseball (laughs) yeah well so that actually got me more into reading too so like when the scholastic book fairs came around when i was in elementary school i'd grab up uh the uh, young Boba Fett novels and then the, the Jedi yep. Quest series by Jude Watson. Those were good as well. I love those books, the Young Boba Fett books. Yes, yes, they're fantastic. Really good stuff, and um surprised at how well they kind of fit into the Boba Fett, Jango Fett like storyline and all that. Yeah, um, very well, and... All those yeah. young adult novels are like canon with each other, I believe. Like they all kind of intersect. Yeah, and even rereading some of them as an adult, like I had, I picked up some of the Jedi Quest series books at a um, comic shop that I have here in town um, for like two dollars a pop. So I was like, oh, I can't say no. And just rereading through them, it's like they're not even like painfully like. Yeah, they're written for like fifth graders but like it's not even like painfully so you know I still managed to do a decent job of having you know plot and the intrigue with the story yeah they're, sure. they're they're well written is the point i was trying to get across <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah lots uh, of uh, dark jedi nonsense yeah it's it's pretty fun oh sorry oh i was gonna say so that was really my um deeper dive into the expanded universe nice, just yeah. reading those books and then the comics coming out well i and then the 2d clone war series as well was a huge influence and that's what actually got started that's what actually started getting me to read the comics as well because my friends would read the comics and they're like oh so like you know these these awesome battles in there and like you know the jedi are so cool so that's what really got me into reading more of the expanded universe and just going down the rabbit hole that I'm in today. Oh yeah, everybody has that awesome little uh, start that gets them down the rabbit hole. I um, the the library at my elementary school had um, it had like all the young Jedi Knight novels, and just one day I'm like, oh, so there so there's books to this too because by that point I had uh, I had seen the OT plus. Phantom Menace was out and I remember just like oh what's this Golden Globe thing and I read it and I'm like okay I'm missing a lot of context to why Luke Skywalker has uh, a niece and a nephew and there's a Wookiee Jedi and but yeah it it was the same thing like from there I ended up getting um, 
into like all this post Return of the Jedi stuff because it just happened to be in the library, and I beg and plead if for my for my mom to, you know, can I please do the chores if you buy me this book? Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah, I think I remember reading those. The the main thing I remember is the Wookiee with the translator droid. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. That'd be Lobaka. Lobaka. Another influence into getting into the EU for me was I had, even though I was only like 11 years old at the time, after Revenge of the Sith, I kind of got into a little bit of a depression where I was like, wow, this is the last Star Wars movie ever. We'll never get any more Star Wars movies. What am I going to do now? I want to know what happens after Return of the Jedi. I want to know what happens in between Revenge of the Sith and um, A New Hope. So that's what really, like, you know, pushed me even further into, like, wanting to uh, explore these new stories because I was just hungry for more Star Wars and I didn't think I was going to get any more movies. Right, the uh, Star Wars drought definitely provides an opportunity. Yeah, and then, lo and behold, that era was, like, some of, one of the greatest eras for all of these stories. Oh yeah, like uh, in that in that post return or, or uh, Revenge of the Sith, yeah, we definitely had like an awesome like um, like second like kind of like a renaissance almost of uh, EU works because by that time uh, the NJO series had wrapped up and they were finally like starting to incorporate big time like uh, prequel era and Clone Wars era uh, into the EU where obviously previously it had been like a big big no no like don't do the prequels. So finally right. being able to get, like, some of the backstory to that, and then we started getting um, novels. Like, I know, Keith, you're currently reading or finished uh, Tatooine Ghost, and, like, that was fir- one of the first big ones that kind of, like, really, really bridged the gap of, like, prequels and OT. Yeah, yeah cause I didn't realize that when I was reading it. it was, yeah. Leia meets uh, Kitster and gets some stories about uh, yes. her dear old dad. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a super fun novel, and yeah, I remember that being a really big milestone. And then I know, uh, uh, Legacy of the Force when they meet um, Aura Singh, and she tells them that she saw him yes. race at the most most yeah. Espa Puntive classic. Yeah, she's she's still kicking around, and then um, obviously later on we get Kaidus doing some flow walking back to the temple or the mm-hmm. Operation Nightfall and stuff. So we really got this awesome like melding of like all these eras and then um i think a couple years later whenever legacy started up even that like got to go back and like revisit some prequel stuff and or yeah, there might be uh shows up again because that that post revenge of the sith era yeah it definitely has some cool stuff like the the dark times i think it's called oh yeah dark times is a uh, and amazing speaking of r Singh, I, I think there's one where it's darth vader in the ghost prison and uh like Darth Vader has to like break out or he has to go to this prison that held like Jedi during the war or something like that and I think R. Singh is in there that was a more recent comic that one was published in 2011 2010 I believe so that was more towards the end of the uh, Lucas era oh, okay uh, but still in that legends well yeah, yeah. it's still oh, yeah. in that general yeah, time period yeah, but so. it was a it was an awesome era of all of like the you know, post return of like the uh, OT and post return of the Jedi and the um, old Republic and um, prequel era stuff finally coming together, and it w- it was just amazing. It, it was a great time. It was, it was it's kind of a double edged sword. It was a great time to be a Star Wars fan, but it was also you know kind of a sucky time too to grow up to be a star wars fan because it's like yes we have all this stuff and everything's getting tied together but now everything's going to change soon so and or be you know completely uh thrown in the garbage but that's a separate issue what do you mean like what are you referring to there well so like you know we have uh the 2008 Clone Wars series kind of overwrote a lot of the oh, right, right. Um, expanded universe stuff and kind of threw out a lot of really great stories. And then a couple years later, uh, the Disney buyout came and the mm-hmm. entirety of the expanded universe was decanonized. And now it kind of sits in this receptacle 
called legends that they just kind of pick out of and recycle whenever they want. Yeah, that is a little bit uh, sad. I would say it's kind of kind of like uh, they, you know they made this whole point to make everything you know like now eh, we'll call this legends and this will be canon. And it all makes sense, and then to just like take stuff from legends anyway and just repurpose it, you know, like why didn't like. Could have saved everyone like about five years if they just started with the Thrawn trilogy at the beginning. Like everybody said, <laughs> everyone said it. But yeah. Well, before they had even talked about decanonizing, I remember like reading like some of Leland Chi's posts and like th they made it sound like that they were going to be like reorganizing the timeline and like trimming some of the fat. And then I guess in 2014, I guess they decided just to throw it all out in general. I don't know if it was out of laziness or if it was, uh, you know, just trying Weird. to appeal appeal to a new fan base or if it was... Um, they still had new stuff coming out with the comics and the novels, like, right up yeah. until the end. It was oh, yeah. chugging along pretty strong. Yeah, I think Issues with royalties, too. Like, uh, well, I know some of the earlier new canon novels were originally supposed to be expanded universe novels, like Tarkin, for example, mm. written by James Lucino, was originally supposed to take place in the expanded universe, but while he was still writing it, they were like, hey, you know, there's <laughs> there's going to be some changes. You know, you might want to uh, edit this because uh, everything you're referencing, and if you don't know James Lucino, he's like the king of oh, yeah. like nuanced little references that you won't understand until you've gone back and reread the book you read, you know, four years ago, and you've read other things in between. Like, oh yeah, so wait, that connects to this obscure comic I read a year ago. Yeah, I remember I was uh, <laughs> talking with one of my buddies uh, specifically about uh, Plagueis, and just like. It's the most offhanded thing, but it's clear it like Lucino's obviously like he, he knows his stuff and just like uh, mm -hmm. when they're talking about Maul's saber staff and he, he name drops Exar Kun, I'm like, Oh he, he did the thing. He did the thing. Oh my god. Yeah. That's where that comes from and uh, he name drops like a bunch of obscure Sith in it and yeah. Well, cause um the name of it the droid escapes me, but uh, Plagueis' droid is in Tarkin. Right. Um but I, yeah, the name the name escapes me, and I I believe um, obviously because it was gonna tie in. I believe it was maybe some of the unused episodes or something. But uh, the Maul comic, Son of Dothamir, I think was originally gonna be EU, and so was Dark Disciple. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, I, I mean, I mean, thank thank God. I'm glad I'm glad the, those two weren't. But that's just my personal opinion. Oh, I I'm. Um, I mean, I, I mean, ask Keith. I'm very anti Maul being revived. Um, and also, I, uh, yeah, Dark Disciple. I haven't read it, but um, everyone I've essentially talked to has been like, yeah, just uh, I'm gonna pretend I didn't read that. So I, I like Quinlan Voss's ending in the comics. I think he got a good ending, and let's just leave it at that. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I would have liked to see more with Corto Voss, his son. And, but whatever. Yeah, but it happened. So I'd also like that Tales comic where him and Vili meeting a young Han, and uh, I think Han actually his DL forty four actually comes from Vili. I can't remember. Oh really? I, I haven't. There's a lot of Star Wars tales. I'm familiar. I haven't actually, uh, I haven't gotten the, around. The to Tales reading. comics are interesting because most of them are non-canon, but yeah, some of I, them are like plausible enough to where like you well, know. These could be canon. They don't really conflict with anything. I think the way it worked is for essentially like the first half of it. It's like okay, these are all their own thing. They some of them obviously, like you said, some of them can fit in the canon. And I I think after a while, I want to say um, oh the Kyle Katarn Yuzhan Vong one. I want to say it's equals and opposites for some reason. Um, I think that was one of the first big ones where it was like, okay, this is a thing that happened, and it fits in, and then from there on, it was kind of, uh, they do like a mix of like, okay, this is in-universe, and this is, you know, a, a goofy, or, you know, out there kind of thing. Yeah, I liked that comic, though, because it had, you know, we had instances of the uh, Imperial Remnant using Dark Troopers after... He had blown up the Ark Hammer in Dark Forces. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know they were in that. 
They're in the the Yuzhan Vong comic. They they they're they are in one Tales comic. Oh, okay, they're in the Tales comic. Thinking, okay. If we're, if we're thinking about the same comic, unless you're talking about the Invasion comics, then no, I don't think so. No, there's like a there's a Tales comic where Kyle Katarn is on a planet and they team up with the Imperial Remnant, I think, and fight the Yuzhan Vong and Kyle Katarn. Yeah, like, and. And okay. one of them, I believe, had a Dark Trooper Phase Three exosuit. Oh, I, I've never noticed that. I I just read it because Kyle Katarn like drop kicks a Yuzhan Vong. So when I was doing research for my um, Dark Trooper video, I believe I read that. Nice, yeah, but but yeah, I might, th- might want to revisit, but yeah, I'll I'll definitely have to go back and read that. I think I have that on my Kindle, so I'm off the next couple days. I might have to do a deep dive. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I mean, on on the subject of the EU, I mean, we've been gushing about it. But like, do you have like some some specific like favorite works in the EU? I know, obviously, you've touched on um, the micro series uh, from uh, the original Clone Wars run and some of that. So, what's what are some of the well, other big ones that you would enjoy? Oh, we were just talking about Lucino, and literally anything by James Lucino, I will love. He's my favorite author in the uh, expanded universe. Just. The, his attention to detail and everything there's just so much love you could tell in his writing and like he really makes it feel like it's all one big universe yeah he he really does and people um uh people always say of the prequels that it's very uh shakespearean but i feel like lucino's dialogue also like borders on that uh, especially some of his stuff from um uh, the unifying force at the end of the NJO series. It his dialogue is very like William Shakespeare esque. The term would be uh, Shakespearean. Um, uh, no, I think the one I'm probably most familiar with is Darth the Plagueis novel. Novel. <clears throat> oh yeah. Uh, I love, I I love like Plagueis, it. some... Darth Maul, Shadow Hunter is a good one as well. Um, Labyrinth of Evil. Oh yeah. Oh Labyrinth yeah. Of Labyrinth of Evil. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. On, on everybody's Dark Lord, list. The Rise of Darth Vader. The Millennium Falcon one's a good one as well. Yeah, the Millennium Falcon is. Uh, I think that's a kind of a hidden gem. I'd actually never even heard of that that book. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's it's excellent because you know it's you you get like a full history of the Millennium Falcon and it's also going back on the subject of all of the eras being tied into one. That's exactly what that novel does. We get, you know, some of the, you know, later Republic era stuff, prequel era stuff, then like between the trilogies and then OT stuff. And then um, we've got and then it it, go, it bumps back and forth to the present day in the uh, um, legacy era, which is like 40 years after the Battle of Yavin. But it, it's just a fantastic read. I highly recommend it. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you can get your hands on it, it's one that I I really enjoyed as well. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it's right up my alley. Yeah, assuming you you care about the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, yeah, it's, it's Millennium Falcon. I'm, I'm a Star Wars fan, sure. I was gonna say, what Star Wars fan doesn't care about the Millennium Falcon? But, um, yeah, I, I so Lucino is probably my favorite. A uh, more controversial author I I like is Karen Travis. Not a lot of people like her, but I like I her know, writing. She's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've I, not gotten around to Republic the Commando series, um, but uh, her stuff in Legacy of the Force was super good, especially mm-hmm. with the, all the Boba Fett stuff is just fantastic. Yeah, um, the Republic Commando novels are great. Legacy of the Force kind of feels like an unofficial like uh, tie up of some of those. Yeah, uh, especially I, the ones where Karen writes, but um, because Republic Commando was never finished, so that's another one of those like things where it's like, oh, you know, I tell people, hey, they're they're great novels, and I recommend reading them, but like, don't get too attached to your characters because there's no ending. <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh, I I enjoy. I think I've only read the first two Republic Commandos. I I have the other ones. I just haven't gotten around to reading them. But yeah. I, Legacy of the Force, I love it, um, and yeah, the novels that she writes in them, I, I think, are really fun as well. And having those, you know, callbacks and tie-ins uh, to to Republic Commander really work as well. But yeah, I I know that yeah, Karen Travis is very, uh, I guess, lo- 
lover hater i suppose would be the ap- apropos term but yeah some people not big into karen travis but i i find her writing style very fun to read so yeah um and you know i i understand some of the criticisms people have and i have my own criticisms of some choices she made in her novels but uh overall i just i love her for just the uh, amount of you know backstory and lore we've got with the mandalorians she really built a whole culture there yeah i've I've seen a lot of people say uh uh kind of tolkien-esque with the yes yeah the, the language that she i don't know if she invented or made but that she you know really really contributed to and i would say out of all of like the novel writers i would say she probably did the most to like bring uh, Mandalorian culture and um, their kind of history to like the forefront, especially like in a novel. Which, given the yeah. name Republic Commando, you wouldn't really expect it to, you know, have so much ties to the history of Mandal- the Mandalorians and everything. Yeah, but she wraps it up in a nice little package, and it's it's awesome too because it's like the Mandalorians were this obscure thing in the old Star Wars Marvel comics from way back in the day and then she brought it up from that ambiguity of s canon and really made it into a part of the star wars universe and made you like really feel like oh yeah this is a you know a whole culture and society that exists within this galaxy far far away yeah and it's really cool because they uh ever since like their kind of initial I guess, run in the Marvel comics. Um, We would get bits and pieces of their culture. Um, Tales of the Jedi strikes out at me, and um, Mm -hmm. off the top of my head, when when did the first Republic Commando come out? Probably like 2003, 4-ish. I believe it was 2004. 2004, Mm. yeah, because... 2004 is when Hard Contact came out. Okay, nice, yeah. So, yeah, because then... Tales of the Jedi, we got, you know, bits and pieces. We found out that there's, like, a Mandalore who is, like, the the leader of them, essentially, and that they have these cool war droids. And then Knights of the Old Republic came out, and we got more bits and pieces. And then, yeah, obviously, yeah, Hard, hard Contact came out, and we got a ton. And then KOTOR 2 came out, and we got a ton, so... We can't neglect, like, you know, the Django Fett stuff. And of course, oh, yeah, you know, open and, yeah all the Django, on. yeah, Open Season did a lot as well, so. Yeah, I remember there's a line in uh, Boba Fett that, what was it, the, I think it's the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy, and, like, the first one, there's, this, like, a part where, like, Boba Fett is cleaning his helmet, and he's, like, looking at it, describing, they didn't really say anything, but he, he's like, oh, it's some, you know, it's a Mandalorian helmet I got from something or someone a long time ago, and then he's don't really talk about it that much that was like 1997 maybe george had like a a sanction on the you know the mando stuff by that point boba's backstory is uh <laughs> boba Bo- the character of boba fett in the expanded universe is this frankenstein of a whole bunch of different stories <coughs> kind of sewn together but the e- expanded universe does a really good job of retconning all of that so that they all work. Whereas, you know, f- for example, like in Dark Empire, you see two, uh, I can't remember if they're bounty hunters or if they're stormtroopers or something. I think they're stormtroopers. And they're they're talking about, they're talking amongst themselves, they're talking about Boba Fett. And they're like, yeah, I heard he was a stormtrooper once and he he killed his commanding officer and, you know, then became a bounty hunter. And then we have, you know, the West End Games source book saying that, oh, he was a journey, he's, his real name is Jaster Mareel and he was a journeyman protector on Concord Dawn. And uh, the, the, the later expanded universe works do a great job of making all of those backstories work where, you know, they took Jaster Mareel and it's like, oh, so Jaster Mareel was actually his grandfather in a way because he adopted Jango Fett after his parents were murdered by the Death Watch and took him on and taught him how to be a Mandalorian and a bounty hunter. And then, you know, we get the... Um, boba fett blood ties comics where it shows him a young boba fett well we don't actually see it but you know it through flashbacks and you know uh dialogue we hear about 
young Boba Fett when he was married to his first wife, Sintes Fell. They tried to settle down, do the farmer life on Concord Dawn, which is his father's home world. And, um, you know, they, yeah, they, they talk about that a little bit in like Legacy of the Force. Yeah. So, like, the Expanded Universe did an excellent job of just taking all of these things, making them like, uh, you know, they're just stories and rumors that people are, you know, talking about because Boba Fett's so mysterious. He doesn't talk, so he doesn't like talk about his past or anything. So it, it's uh, really a good way to retcon these things, but not actually retcon them. So like, none of the, none of his backstories are actually, you know, decanonized. They're all part of him, and it's just a very unique thing that the EU is able to do. And I don't think it got enough credit for that. Yeah, the, the things like the uh, for a thousand generations, Jedi Knights were Guardians of Peace, and then in you know like Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones, they say something about oh, it's been a Republic for a thousand years. And like, wait, <laughs> that's wrong. We gotta. We got to do something to explain that in a book. And then they just made the Darth Bane book just for that. No. Well, yeah, because so, uh, you know, Obi-Wan in A New Hope says for over a thousand generations, you know, the Jedi were guardians of peace and freedom in the Republic. And a generation is 25 years. So naturally, you know, the writers assumed, OK, so the Republic is at least 25,000 years old. But then we have Sio Bibble in the Attack of the Clones saying there hasn't been a full scale war since the formation of the Republic. But we know from, you know, Knights of the Old Republic and Tales of the Jedi, yeah. that is absolutely oh, yeah. incorrect. Very, very, <laughs> very false. Yeah. So they made, you know, the Darth Bane novels and the Jedi versus Sith comic where it's like, you know, the, the new Sith Wars happened a thousand years ago and then the Republic was destroyed but then reformed. So... The, 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 it's very interesting. I like that they kept the twenty five thousand years thing. Uh, did you? What did you, What did you think of the uh, Dawn of the Jedi comics? I have yet to actually read the Dawn of the Jedi comics. That's on my list. I want to finish uh, the Legacy era before I do that. Definitely, uh, they're definitely different. Yeah, yeah very. So, that's the that's the other wonderful thing about the expanded universe is just how massive it is. And even though I've been delving in it since I was, you know, a wee lad, I, there's still stuff I haven't read still obscure things I'm finding. And it's, it's great. Probably it's like enough covering a $20 uh, bill in an old, uh, in an old, like, um, jacket that you pull out. It's like, Oh, well, sweet. This is awesome. You know, well, if you kept, you know, finding the dollar bill. Yeah. yeah. It's more awesome if you keep finding the dollar bill. But eventually you won't find any more. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's that's one of the things, too, is I, um, not, not to toot my own horn, but all the, um, all the adult um, expanded universe novels I, I own, and there are some of them I just literally just still haven't gotten around to reading just because other stuff comes up and, and there's a million ongoing comics that I'm reading and some of it is and, and, and no offense to uh, Dawn of the Jedi but it's Dawn of the Jedi so I haven't gotten around to reading some of it so for overly specific reasons that I is a thousand videos in and of themselves I listened to about an hour of the Dawn of the Jedi audiobook, and then I just never finished it because I've been spoiled by Mark Thompson's narrations. Oh my god, just the best. And they, they, they had a different narrator this time, and she, she was fine. It's just, I was used to Mark Thompson's different, like, little impressions he does for every tiny character. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, the big two, I would say, of Star Wars narrations are... Uh, Mark Thompson and Jonathan Davis, and mm -hmm. no offense, but one is better than the other. Um, yeah, and it's Mark Thompson, and it, it's Mark Thompson by like a hundred miles. <laughs> <He's>... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but no, Don of the Jedi has one very specific retcon that I I hate. Keith, I believe you've seen me like complain about it nonstop, and that's a, the the Tuscan storyteller in uh, in the first Knights of the Old Republic game. His, the story that he tells you of the origins of humanity and everything is unfortunately done away with with Dawn of the Jedi, and I, it's just me being salty about it. So, 
I mean, it's not really done away with. I think there's like one panel in the comic where they show like a tropical Tatooine and like there were cotton infant empires on there. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't need to get into I'll I'll be talking and in destroyed everything. Um, That's but, the coolest part of the comic, though, is seeing the Rakatan Infinite Empire from Kotor. Should show that. Yeah, it's wacky cool stuff thing there. That never shows up. To veer off the uh, expanded universe yes. for a hard second. Um, could Ted, talk about it forever. Yeah, we we could talk about it forever. But Tad, do you have any big thoughts on? Uh, the Mandalorian and the very recently finished first season of the book of Boba Fett. Is it something that like you could, you know, kind of get into and just enjoy on its own? Or I guess, do you kind of have any stronger five seconds? You're just like yelling at the screen. Like that's yeah. stupid. <laughs> so as I've stated in previous videos, I have not really consumed any new Canon stuff and it's, you know, I, I get a lot of flack from it. I get called a hypocrite. I get called not a true star Wars fan, yada, yada, yada. Um, boo, boo those but <laughs> but the, the the thing is my issue is with new canon stuff is i i can't well, what i need to do in order to actually be able to sit through something like that and enjoy it is turn my brain off yep. and i'm and it, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not insulting anybody i'm not trying to insult anybody that likes the you know the new canon or any of the new movies but you know i've been you know in the expanded universe for too long and in this for too many years where i know the rules of how the galaxy works and then it it upsets me when i see those rules being broken so one of the one of the only star wars new star wars movies that i have seen is rogue one and i i did it on a on a dare and <laughs> i it, it was i had made notes during the film just so I could go back and just be like, what was this movie? Um, <laughs> you know, there, there was things that like, no, no, you can't go into hyperspace within a planet's gravity well. Like, things like that would annoy the ever-loving crap out of me. And, you know, I hear, like, the, the new shows, like the Mandalorian Book of Boba Fett, are a lot more, you know, faithful to, like, how, like, the, you know, the rules of the Star Wars universe, but... um. My fear with the Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett was them being new canon, and you know, with um, it, it's it's you know, as you, you just can't about, reconcile like your legends brain with the canon yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I I can't, and you know, then I'm thinking like, you know, I just watching the promos and stuff for the Mandalorian and like some of the TV spots. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, you know, in an alternate universe. You know, we have an expanded universe version of this where where Karen Travis is on the writer's board and we have proper Mandos running around. And Boba Fett is, you know, a proper Boba Fett. Uh, not saying that he is or isn't, because, again, I haven't seen the new shows, so I, I can't criticize them in that way. But um, and my other fear with the um, Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett, because... You, you touched on it a little bit where, you know, about my videos about, you know, the, you know, my feelings on Star Wars, the Clone Wars, um, with, with Dave Filoni being attached to these projects, I was afraid that it would just become a live action TCW reunion. Mm, yeah. And that pretty that's close why, I, well, I mean, Cad Bane, Ahsoka, Bo-Katan. Yeah probably some other ones that i don't know of uh so it, it essentially my fears were correct so it's like i'm in a way i'm glad i didn't just jump on board the bandwagon well, i think uh, i think favreau's keeping feloni on a pretty short leash you know what like basically he gets like one episode a season it seems like and then john favreau's kind of just writing most of the stuff yeah, and I'm I'm sure it's good. It's just it's not what I'm interested in, and it's not something that I myself would find enjoyable. I don't think. And you know, to to those but who you, do you have, enjoy you have it, watched Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett, right? I have not watched it, and I oh. don't really uh, plan on it. But I've you know I've seen like you know the articles, and I've seen like you know. TV spots, so it's like, I know Ahsoka shows up. I know Cad Bane shows up, and that's the moment where I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm not even going to bother. 
Yeah, I'm sure Ahsoka fans got a pretty big kick out of her just kind of showing up for like like half a minute in some episodes. Yeah. Right. No. I mean, and again, it's, you know, I'm not poo pooing on anybody who does like this stuff. It's just not for me. Wow. So just totally just shunning it, just putting it to the side. Like, no. I, I'm well aware I'm living under a rock, but I've made it a nice, cozy rock. Well, and, and and you know what? That that's completely fair. Um, I um, I really enjoy it, and the easiest way for me to do it, and not saying you have to do it this way or or consume it, but um, I I looked at it. Um, so so I'm I'm a big Marvel fan. I love the Marvel comics. Um, and I just look at it as you know when I'm watching one and then going back and reading Legend stuff. It's like, um, uh, the six one six canon versus like the ultimate universe. It's two different things. And so I turn off my one brain when I watch the one thing and turn it back on when I go back to the other thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it. Just like your, you know, kind of easy going out outlook on it. Um, what I've always said is, uh, you know, like what you like and you just don't be a dick about it. And I found that's right. the easiest way to get through it. Cause, um, because I really love Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. I know Keith, you enjoyed both. We obviously just did a yeah. Video uh, on that. If I could just talk about like the way that they did Mandalorians in Book of Boba Fett, or well, not Book of Boba, uh, you know the Mandalorian mm-hmm. show. Uh, yeah, it kind of seems like Favreau is kind of trying to sort of retcon Mandalorians, make them more uh, like similar to how they are in Legends. Basically, you know, main character Mando, he does not take his helmet off because of his rule thing of course there's not a rule in legends but mandalorians basically just don't take their helmets off anyway right well i mean boba fett himself would refrain from taking his helmet off in public but that's just him you know years and years of bounty hunting and being a consummate professional his helmet is his identity that's his brand because you know he's an independent (laughs) contractor um, yeah, I always like that stuff with him. We, we, him and his helmet. You know, he doesn't see his face as his actual face. His, like his helmet is his face. He's like Rorschach. Yeah. Where's my yeah. face? Exactly. And you know, we we have we have uh, instances in the expanded universe of Mandalorians taking their helmets off all the time. Uh, some instances of Mandalorians just not even really wearing their armor. Like Cal Skarada, uh at times would just wear a leather jacket. And you know, same with Kandor Sordo. Oh, uh, that's literally what I was going to say. Like the. Um, the first Mandalorian I remember attaching myself to, because when I was a kid, I was never a huge huge Boba Fett fan. Um, but when I played Knights of the Old Republic when it came out in 2003, I was like, oh my god, Kanders, he's so cool. He's telling me all these mm-hmm. you know, cracked out war stories where he's, you know, riding a basilisk war droid from orbit. And I'm like, oh my god. And and he wears like a, like pants and a vest. Like he wears what I wear to work. Yeah. Obviously, he also carries, like, a giant gun, which I, I can't do at work, but... Yeah. I mean, we have instances of, like, Mandalorians sleeping in their armor and helmets, like, during wartime. Like, if they're in a foxhole or something, but, you know, they gotta eat, too. Yeah. Yeah, but I... I yeah. I mean, to circle back to the question, I, I think they're both really fun, but yeah, I could I could see how, you know... It's, it's irreconcilable for some people and some people... I mean, I know some people who have watched both who don't consume the Expanded Universe and they're like, eh, not my thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, you know, it's a TV show. Not everyone likes TV shows. Right. Yeah. Uh, some people are more, you know, into books. Some people are more into comics. Uh, yeah. Some people are more into TV shows. And, you know, with Star Wars being a visual medium, a lot more people will be more interested in the movies and the TV shows versus, you know, the books and the comics and the video games, but um, you know Maybe one of those people that likes to read, like, the novelized version of, uh, you know A New Hope or something Right? Or you could be audio, maybe you like the audiobooks, maybe the radio dramas, too which oh, are yeah, the classic in their own, right? But Dark Empire, yep yeah, the, the yeah when when you, when you were talking about the Dark Empire, uh, uh, Boba Fett origin, I immediately thought of like how awkward the, the audio dramas of it are at are at some point where they're like, they kind of just cut in and it's like these two people talking. Oh, Boba Fett killed this guy, and Boba Fett has like a weird robot voice and it, it's great. I love him. Well, yeah, yeah like a droid. Because <laughs> like the the comics like I don't. 
people behave in comics differently than they do in real life, so it's not organic when you try to transfer that to an audio format. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, yeah, it's it's great. But yeah, that's 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 a that is a great insight on into uh, the uh, the the Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. Um, yeah, so basically, to... I, d I you know uh, don't I don't poo poo on whatever you know other people like, and I just ask that people you know respect my you know liking of the expanded universe. You know, I won't crap on your thing if you don't crap on mine. You know. Yeah, which is right, like, uh, no no need to chime in with the old you know the expanded universe is a convoluted mess. You're the dirt. Uh, the Scooby, the Jedi droid. Yeah. Over and over and I'm obviously, honestly extremely tired of talking about. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, Legends is bad because there was a Jedi droid in it, and then five seconds later, there's an actual Jedi droid in some Star Wars video game. Yeah. You see that? Uh, I, I have not. They gave a droid a lightsaber. Nice. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's... um. Yeah, I think that's, that's one thing I can appreciate about most Star Wars fans. I know... The, the meme on the internet is nobody hates Star Wars more than Star Wars fans, but I, for the most part, like, yeah, obviously, yeah, you know, people on the internet are, they're the loudest, most obnoxious people in on the entire planet, but, like, hmm. if you ever actually sit, like, like, um, my, one of my, my best friend who I've known since, like, the fifth grade, like, he knows nothing of the expanded universe outside of, like, the original Battlefront 2 and, um, Empire at War, but we can, we can still coexist, like, it, there, there's this amazing dis divide that people on the internet have like artificially created where if you if you love the expanded universe well, then you hate everything that's come out since 2014 or if you love everything that's come out since then then you hate the expanded universe and it's like no the majority of people will just you know exist it's like i mean it's, it's not like it's um like the mets versus yankees or anything to throw a sports analogy out there I mean, even those rivalries are kind of silly when you really think about it, but... Oh, yeah, I mean, it's literally, like... It's a, it's a sport. It's for fun. Yeah, it's it's done for a sport. No need to but... flip cars, but... <laughs> I, I, will, I will say, in, in my defense, I, I hate the Yankees, so... So I contribute to that one, but they know what they did. I don't know what they did. The great thing about Star Wars is, you know, you've got plenty of stuff that you could just pick one era and just get super hyper focused and obsessed with that and jump right. on something else right and go, going back on um that train of thought when um ah, speaking of trains of thought i lost mine oh no oh no <laughs> uh oh okay i remember what i was gonna say so like you know you sit down and you ask a star wars fan like you know in instead of Star Wars fans actually hating Star Wars. We just all like different types of Star Wars. We are all fans that grew up in different eras of Star Wars and, you know, like different things. We were attached to the things that uh, we first experienced. Like, you know, the the older, like when I'm talking about the older fans, I'm going to talk about like people like my father's age who saw the, you know, original movies right. back in the day, they're going to be more inclined to like the original movies and then nothing else. You know, people like me who grew up with the prequels and then the, the later expanded universe era are going to be inclined to like the prequels and all that stuff. And, you know, people who are now growing up with all the sequels and stuff, um, they're liking what they like. And then eventually it'll be all be rebooted again in another 10 or 20 years. And then it'll be a new whole new generation of fans and the cycle will just keep going and going. Yeah. And, and, and that's just the thing with such a long running series. I mean, star Wars has existed since the seventies, like literally uh, the, the first movie came out when my mom, the same year my mom was born. And so like, mm -hmm. there's always going to be like, uh, you know, this group who grew up with this and it, it's exactly like you said. And obviously there are going to be, you know, individuals who cross over and just read read and watch everything i mean i i know people who have literally just from start to finish like they just literally enjoy everything essentially and it's it's just gonna continue so this whole doomer mentality uh is, is another i think kind of artificial thing that was kind of made for for no reason at all well, i understand some people you know 
some people's kind of uh, negative outlooks on the new stuff. It's it's because when Disney took over, they really did alienate a lot of fans. Oh yeah, and, and I, I will agree with that though. Yeah, the 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 way they handled things wasn't. It, it could have been done better. It could have been done in a way where nobody felt alienated and they still could have made their movies and stuff but oh yeah i um, not like they put up a giant banner saying hey you know we're going for the normies now but it's basically what they did yeah and even that's even fine but don't forget about the people who've been keeping the franchise alive during the dark ages you know well and and that's and that, yeah. you did forget that they have they have kids all these old fans yeah True, and, but... and when you mentioned dark ages though that is a great point because um a lot of people really discount how um, the EU, especially like those early comics and novels uh, that came out in the the early to mid '90s, really like rejuvenated like Star Wars and like the the cultural zeitgeist. Like um, I, I even have like like I mentioned earlier, my my best friend he knows diddly squat about the EU outside of a couple things and even when like thrawn came on on rebels he's like oh thrawn like i know who that is from like empire at war yeah well yeah from empire at war but even then like you know you go on wikipedia one time when you're going to the bathroom and you fall down a weird rabbit hole and all of a sudden you know like the general stuff of like a lot of stuff and um the, the eu is kind of to thank for that because in the early like late eighties, early nineties, like Star Wars was not like the the pop culture powerhouse that it is today. It was no. I wouldn't say like, you know, for like, you know, like like nerdy people, but like it had fallen very far after the OT was finished up. And then the Thrawn trilogy and Dark Empire kinda came out I think well Thrawn trilogy I believe came out first and then uh, Dark Empire after that, and that really rejuvenated, and then we kind of had that, like, a first renaissance of uh, novels and comics and stuff until we got the prequels in 99 onwards, so. And that was just an explosion of new Star Wars content and and media and toys and whatnot. And kind of going off on that, I, I disagree a tiny bit because... I feel like it's more acceptable to be a Star Wars fan today than it was even like 10, 15 years ago. I remember getting bullied for liking Star Wars, and it's like now seemingly oh. everybody likes Star I'm Wars. So sorry. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I, it, and it could just be like the the group of kids I ended up hanging out with after baseball practice. But yeah, I, I guess I, 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 never, I never had that, that side of it. So that that's very interesting to see. Obviously, unfortunate that it happened. I'd obviously yeah, I think in like... Nobody second before. or third grade i can't like sometime when revenge of the sith came out yeah all my friends were into star wars we all just would talk about it all the time it was like so hype i mean like you know elementary school it was it was fine i wasn't bullied but like when i got into high school i remember like uh, i was playing battlefront elite squadron on my psp and one of our off days on gym when we weren't doing anything and we were just kind of sitting on the bleachers and uh one of the kids broke my PSP because I oh. wasn't playing Madden or something stupid like that. Not saying that Madden's, wow. Madden's a stupid game. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. Mad yeah. like Madden in the year 2022 is, is awful. But yeah, like tw like 15 years ago, yeah, Madden was amazing. But yeah, yeah. but like you know, and now like it's everywhere, and everybody's a Star Wars fan, and it's like. I kind of equate it a little bit to like Dungeons and Dragons where like Dungeons and Dragons used to be like this thing for nerds and social yeah. outcasts. And then all of a sudden it's on stranger things. Now everybody plays Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, okay, well, you know, you know pe people in my dad's era got, you know, swirlies for liking this stuff. Now everybody's okay to play Dungeons and Dragons. It's like, yeah, fantasy in general has just gotten like really accepted. Yeah, I would and say. I'm, I'm not uh, saying that's a bad thing. It's, a, oh, it's no. an excellent thing. It, yeah, it I'm is just a little salty because yeah. it wasn't a combination of thing when I was a kid. Probably, well, like for like there was like Lord of the Rings the trilogy came out, but then like you know Game of Thrones really stuck it in there with like making just fantasy a cool, mm -hmm. sexy thing. Yeah, quote yeah. unquote. Yeah, and I, I, I would, I would definitely agree. Like, um, like the the Star Wars movies have always been like you know, that kind of popular thing. But yeah, I, I could definitely see where in the early to mid 2000s, how like 
oh, hey, I just, like, read this book about uh, what happens leading up to episode three and people being like, okay, well, I, I watched the movie. I read the, op- I read the opening crawl. I know what happened. So, yeah, I could definitely see that. I think I just, I, I was just very um, fortunate and privileged enough to have a friend group who was into that kind of lame, nerdy stuff. But we, but I, I mean, I guess we also played baseball, so I guess we had an in, I guess. Yeah, so you were like pseudo jocks. I was just a social outcast completely. So, <laughs> mm. I just really liked to read a lot. That was like my main thing. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. I guess. But things like that, they kind of you know go in and out of style. Uh, That's true. You know, I think in the if in the fifties, if you remember you know, reading a comics, you might have gotten bullied for that or made fun of. Nowadays, mm-hmm. someone sees you reading a comic, they probably be like, "Wow, you're reading an actual comic. That's amazing." <laughs> I didn't know they still made those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, I guess off the topic of the EU and comics, again, um, uh, Ted, do you do you have, like, a favorite, like, video that you've made? Like, is there one that, like, sticks out to you as, like, this is the best thing I've done for YouTube, or? Well, I'm, I'm editing my format so often. Like, I'm always making little changes and, and you know, finding ways to improve that... You know, I'll say, oh, I think this was the best one I've done so far. And then a couple months later, like, nope, this one is, you know, it's like I've got videos that are published now. I'm like, that's a good video. But I think the one I'm working on now is good. And, you know, I just make all these little changes here and there just to kind of enhance the viewer's um, experience and to just try to get my points across more and sound more professional and you know, look more professional and enhance my editing skills. So I don't really have a favorite video because I just keep evolving my format to where every video that I publish is kind of my favorite video until yeah, I publish I mean, the next one. I watched some of your lore videos. Uh, yeah, I really like the format. You kind of like doing it as, you know, this Tad Larkin character. You got this like sort of hologram thing going on where you're like a holographic guide to the universe kind of thing very cool yeah the whole premise of the channel is you're you know watching holographic transmissions that this amateur mandalorian historian is just beaming into space because you know the empire has put restrictions on information and he wants the truth out there so he beams all of this information into space and you're picking up on it is the uh general premise of the channel and i'm really trying to like get that hologram effect while also trying to uh it's definitely a funny scenario yeah that's, and, that just seems know, funny to me my my uh audio quality has dramatic has drastically improved like i was using a lot of uh sound effects and and uh like stuff to like you know, enhance my voice and make it sound like I'm, you know, talking under a helmet. And I've kind of done away with a little bit of that to increase intelligibility. And I'm, I think the product I'm turning out now is um, a lot more uh, quality to what I'm looking for. If that makes any sense. Oh no! I, oh yeah, it's uh, very yeah. professional. You know, I I definitely. I, wa- I wanted to ask maybe about. Uh, where did this uh, character of yours, you know, Tad Larkin, like, come from? Or how did so, you come up with him? Yeah, uh, so, um, Tad Larkin himself is actually from a uh, Warhammer 40,000 role-playing book, um, Rogue Trader. My friends and I were playing, and uh, I had to come up with a name for a character, so I just rolled the dice, and I got uh, Tad for the first name, and then Larkin for the last name and then when i was thinking about starting this channel i'm like well i need a you know a name for this character and i'm like you know i really liked the name of that uh rogue trader character i had for the warhammer 40,000 uh rpg we did a a year or two back so i flipped through and i'm like oh yeah that was his name so uh i kind of made it i put an apostrophe in there to make it more Mandaloriany and less, you know, more hammery. And uh, Tad Larkin was born, and I had the idea to make all this like um, armor stuff. I 
ordered like armor plates off of like Etsy and stuff, and I spray painted everything. I I just really brought the character to life, and I was inspired by the old Republic uh, um, timeline videos that they had on the old Republic website back in the day, where Lance Henriksen would play this Jedi historian character, and you it was like you were watching a uh, holocron. And I wanted to do like a similar experience because I don't think it had been done before with any lore channel. Huh. I was not uh, I'm not familiar with those videos, but uh, yeah, the character definitely looks great. Like I like the orange. Very yeah. Different. The, so the orange that the character design comes from um, a friend of mine on Mod DB many years ago. He made like a a fan made Mandalorian thing for me. And he fell off the face of the earth, so it's kind of like an homage to him. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that sucks. Uh, he just kind of like lost contact with that that online friend who inspired the the armor. Yeah. Well, he inspired at least the colors. I took it my own way. Yeah. Speak yeah, for, uh, uh, for a lot of it. Yeah. Speak I kind of, I have like a Mando o OC um, from a uh, from uh, an RPG me and Kate did. Oh, uh, yep. I was gonna I was gonna bring up like. You, you guys can have a meeting of, of minds of Aiden Kurz versus um, versus Tad Larkin. Huh. Yeah, he's basically my uh, basically my pretty much my Boba Fett Stan character. I just wanted to make <laughs> my own little Boba Fett OC so I could <laughs> role play as Boba Fett. He's basically just I call him knockoff dollar store Boba Fett. It's Boba uh, Fett without being Boba Fett. Exactly. Yeah, and it's your Jodo cast. The, like the way I made him, he's just like I just made a very simple backstory from him. He was like a Mandalorian merc on a, you know, on a trade ship or something like that. They get attacked by Trandoshan pirates. Ship crashes on Raxus Prime. Uh, he has to get his. He meets a, a rusty uh, TB droid. You know the the medical droid from Empire. Mm -hmm. And it uh, it has to like 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 amputate one of his arms and replace it with like a droid arm so i started off with like a droid arm oh, no, it, it replaced it with his own arm oh Cause, sure because because rusty only had one arm i know and then i and then i had this like rusted out um like uh durasteel mandalorian armor to go with it i had like a durasteel biscod definitely very much uh, you know i think i had no I, I got i got my hands on a west star pistol at one point but uh yeah, I just went full. Oh, super scarred face, of course, for the character to match. Oh yeah, you gotta Boba have Fett. that with your Mando OC. Yeah. <laughs> and then he also ended up being force sensitive, so I got to do some Mando Jedi action. Yeah, very. There you go. Yeah, very, very RPG character. <laughs> yeah. Um, all all my OCs are are Corellian pilots, so I'm I'm also in the lot of overused tropes, so. Oh, you did the. Uh, you wanted to do the Han Solo rogue. Oh yeah, just it, it's always Han Solo, so I have an excuse to crack lame jokes and and all that. So, I like I like the idea that Corelli is just a planet of Han Solos. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, you do it's, that for every every race, you know. It's a fun, yeah. It, it oh no, it, it's yeah, it's fun. I love each planet having their own thing. Ted, do you, Ted, do you do ever do any? Like, have you done like a Star Wars RPG and like incorporated your? um oc into it at all or steered away from it or so uh tad has never appeared in any of our star wars rpgs but my friends and i have done a star wars rpg where we were so the whole thing we made our own kind of we never used any like the 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 fantasy flight game source book so we made our own and um like my friend Zach, he made all the rules and he made like the spreadsheets for like the character sheets nice. and like how like the mechanics of like the dice rolls and everything. And we played in a game called Tabletop Simulator, which is exactly what you'd expect. It simu simulates like tabletop board games. And we had used like Armada pieces oh, nice, from nice. yeah from Star Wars Armada. I love and Armada. the whole yeah the whole premise of the uh, RPG was. We're this uh, sort of ragtag imperial fleet sent to this fringe sector to you know, kind of keep the peace and root out some uh, rumors of rebels. And um, 
it ended up like going into like the uh, New Republic era a little bit too, like past Palpatine's death at Endor, and we had characters appear like Thrawn appeared. Um, what's his face? Uh, Inquisitor Jarek appeared as oh, well. Oh, nice! Uh, I yeah. actually uh, I did a a, a one shot, and I had Jarek show up, and all the the party got to play as like op jedi for one for like one game and then i had jarek just come in and kill them all just so i could i could have jarek in it so i actually get that reference because i'm currently playing star wars jedi knight 2 nice yeah Boom. and uh so my character was just he was this uh, imperial captain of a raider class corvette and um his whole backstory was that he served under Palian during the clone wars and he kind of wanted to like he he had ambitious goals, and I tried to screw over some of my uh, party members at one Ooh. time as well to try to seize control. And I foolishly allied myself with Jarek and almost got killed, but it was fun. <laughs> but no, I did not bring Tad Larkin into that. Oh, your character tried to like team up with the bad guy. Yeah, to kind of he wanted control of the fleet. He wanted a position. He's very <laughs> like. Uh, I kind of based him a little bit off of like Zinge, but not like too cartoonishly bombastic as Zinge was. Yeah. Who? Zinge? Oh, yeah. Oh. Warlord Zinge. He was one of the um, post Imperial Era warlords. He was one of the big fish that the New Republic had to take out hmm. before yeah, yeah. they could really consolidate power. He's a uh, X Wing antagonist, right? Yeah, X Wing. Yeah. A uh, couple okay. of different novels. Um, courtship of Princess Leia as well. Oh, yep. Yeah, uh, okay. He's, yeah. I yeah. was trying to think he's definitely in, in that one. Definitely a love it or hate it novel. I love Courtship of Princess Leia. It gives I, us so much info on Dathomir and well, the... It's, it's the first big, Dathomir like, appearance Witcher. of, like, Dathomir. Yeah. I haven't read that one. I'm reading, well, Tatooine Ghost that talks about it a lot. Yeah, you'll... Is it, like, right after that, I think, or... Well, sort of after that. Publication wise, uh, I, it's probably like a decade. Tatooine Ghost came out like a decade ish after. But yeah, in no, like in the timeline, it's like yeah, in the timeline. Yeah, it's, yeah, they 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 just got married, didn't they? Yep. yep. Yeah. So yeah, so it references a lot of courtship. And then that's all. That, that's also an interesting novel too, because you start getting into Heir to the Empire too, with you know Thrawn trying to find the. Uh, codes hidden in the Killick Twilight. Yeah, and then uh, I read this part where it's like, kind of I hinted at that Thrawn was one of the stormtroopers that was like following them. He was like in disguise. Oh, really? Something like that. <laughs> He's being like, he, the stormtrooper had like this super strict Thrawn mentality. He even like executed one of his soldiers for like talking back or something along that. Yeah. Uh, Tatooine Ghost is good. Yeah. It's I'm good the... though. Yeah, on the on the topic of uh, courtship, which would be a, a pretty spicy, um, it, I guess I guess take on a novel like like I said, love it or hate it. Do you have like a like what what's your hottest Star Wars take? I mean, feel free to be as you know well, I mean, blazing wing challenges you'd like to be on it. I mean, like, well, <laughs> you've talked about this a lot on your podcasts because I did watch a few of them before I agreed to uh be on with you guys but you know i'm just making sure you guys weren't like you know crazies but you guys are cool well we're, but, we're definitely yeah. definitely on the well, less crazy but side, on yeah. the on the, on the good on good good crazy not bad crazy <laughs> but uh yeah but obviously my hottest take is my more infamous videos on my captain fordo channel where i explain how the 2008 Clone Wars series doesn't fit in really at all with the uh, expanded universe. And that's something that riles a lot of people up, even though it's not like, it's not an inherently yeah, bad that to me thing. Isn't, it's not, that to me just seems like not controversial. That's like, it's totally agree with that 100%. Like, Clone Wars, 2008 Clone Wars should just be pushed all the way into canon completely cut off separated from legends everything's everyone's happy yeah but there are people that are very very fanatical about it oh yeah it's yeah 
yeah, Clone Wars has a very, very, I guess, defensive might not be the right word, but very, you know, protective of, you know, that TV show. Mm -hmm. Uh, It reminds me of, like, um, uh, like, like fans of the Game of Thrones TV show who will, like, fight tooth and nail and say that, like, everything that is commonly regarded as bad is bad. And not saying Clone Wars is uh bad or anything if you you know like we've mentioned right. earlier if, if you love it you know more power to you like you, it's a tv show feel free to like it or not it affects yeah. uh, russell's my jimmy's none but yeah it's it is probably certainly, a lot of people's expo- first exposure to star wars was yeah. that clone wars tv show yeah but i've yeah on, on uh certain realms of the internet i've definitely gotten some flack for uh not i guess kowtowing to the dave filoni uh, oh god was it t cannon because i know he got his own yeah he had his cannon. own cannon tier it was it was called t cannon okay that's what i thought uh, yeah but yeah he had his own thing and if you yeah there's a very vocal group of people who if you don't like kowtow before that like you're gonna you're gonna get the the crap storm but the problem is before the expanded universe's decanonization there was never an official timeline published that fully integrated tcw in with the rest of the expanded universe you had like the essential guide to warfare and the essential atlas which um by the the times that those were published at they had you know gotten some stuff in from seasons one and two and i think they may have gotten as far as seasons as like season four but a majority of the show was never really fully properly integrated into the expanded universe. They hadn't really rolled out the kinks. And, you know, there were some, like, retcons in, like, the the Jedi Handbook and the Book of the Sith and the Bounty Hunter's Code, but a lot of them didn't really make any sense. And... I find it just easier to unretcon TCW to well to retcon TCW out of the expanded universe yeah. and unretcon everything it retconned. Yeah, like yeah, it really just does not make sense with you know like the, exp- the regular main expanded universe timeline. I know, and and there's there's some things you you unfortunately have to keep like with the with the mortis arc you have to keep the father and the son and the and the mother because that's really uh um important when you get to like fate of the jedi but yeah and and really though that's kind of the the biggest thing i guess that kind of stayed like past like tcw like itself besides stuff that happened in the the clone wars era that's the only thing that really kind of creeped like outside of that uh prequels clone wars era and i believe besides, maybe... okay. besides the direct tie-in novels like uh yeah, clone yeah. wars gambit stealth and siege and one of them was actually written by karen travis but yeah and i think there's uh, some like uh comics as well that kind of tie into the show but like yeah out, outside of like the prequel clone wars era like yeah the mortis stuff is it, it's the only stuff that stayed like past like <laughs> 19 when you, BBY. When, when you read a lot of um, the expanded universe uh, uh, that was published around the time of the TV show's airing, you kind of get the uh, impression that, like, like for example, they rare they never mention Ahsoka. And oh, not, never. Never. They never mention Ahsoka, and I believe that is because we didn't know what was going to happen with Ahsoka. A lot, I've, a lot of people, including myself, assumed. She, she was just gonna die because she's not in in Revenge of the Sith, and that would give Anakin some sort of you know another tick in dark side points on the proverbial meter. But um, fortunately, yeah. that was not the case. No, well, you kind of get the sense that like they're avoiding it like the plague. But then you you know you get little things like um, in Darth Plagueis, you know the whole thing with maul's origin which when i yeah, read yeah, it kind of and it reread it felt a little uh you know out of place oh it's, like it's he, yeah you're like he originally right, yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like he had originally written something else well, I, in his place. I feel and then like um, had to change it retroactively. Yeah, I feel like Maul probably, as a child, was not going to be in it at all, and they would have you know Maul show up in like the later latter half of the book, like he kind of did, where it, it's you know it, it it's just Maul doing Maul stuff, and yeah, because because it is very out of place, like. You open up the chapter and Palpatine's on Dathomir, and this woman goes up to him and he's like, "Hey, take my baby." Oh, okay, yeah. sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, sure, okay. His mom's literally like, "Hey, so there's this crazy Dathomir witch named Mother Talzin. She's trying to kill my baby here." Yeah, and Palpatine's and just like, "Oh, okay, yeah." Is that the one yeah. thing that good that vibes connects TCW? And and you know, and you read the comics, and it's like, okay, well, he's actually found. You know, as a little orphan boy on the streets of Iridonia. <laughs> so it's, like, completely different. But, yeah, other, other than, like, stuff like that, and, like, oh, in, in Kenobi, there's one small mention of Satine. Yep. But other than that, nothing, really. Yeah, it, it's nothing, uh, yeah, like, literally, uh, if you had, like, a bottle of whiteout, you could, uh, you could white out everything, all the TCW references, and still have enough for your office work. Yeah, and, you know, I'm fine. I, I never bothered with any of the direct tie-in novels. I, you know... Yeah, I... I they, uh, they probably even got retconned by the show, let's, let's face it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I, I think just to be, uh, uh, spiteful, I guess, for my, um... I guess I guess dislike of uh, kind of what Dave Filoni did. I those are the only uh, EU novels that I, I don't own are the uh, couple direct Clone Wars tie-ins. So, mm-hmm. and I think I couldn't get them in hardcover. So I just I was like, no, I was I was on a pretentious hardcover streak at the time. So I that's you don't have with my Tolkien one. books. That's what I do for for that. I hit the last three books that Christopher Tolkien published. I had to have them in hardcover. I could not get soft cover. Yeah. <laughs> just, just as a as a preference, I just prefer hardcover for reading. Uh, for a, right, a weird little side tangent, but uh, but a lot of the EU novels Depends. just straight up never came out as hardcovers. No, a lot of them were like the little, you know, eight inch by four inch paperbacks. Yes, yeah, just regular paperbacks. Yeah, but I like uh, those. I don't know. It feels like if if it's like a really big novel and it's hardcover, it can be kind of annoying. To oh, read. I, I love it. I love the uh, biblical esque feel of a big book in my hand. But but that's just me. That's just a weird personal preference that I have. It's not weird, but I get you. Yeah, overly specific, I'd say. Yeah, so I guess that would be my hot take. Nice. That I know a lot of people don't agree with, but it's all right. Yeah, yeah, and um, well, I mean, you would kind of mentioned it, um, but uh, with uh, Chris Christopher Tolkien's some of the later stuff he published, um, under that kind of legendarium. Um, but are are there outside of Star Wars? What are some of the the other franchises that you kind of uh, frequent or that you enjoy? I'm assuming oh, I, Tolkien's going to be one of them. Oh yeah, I'm I'm probably as knowledgeable about. Tolkien's work, or maybe even more so than I am about Star Wars. Um, I also consider myself a casual fan of Warhammer Forty Thousand. Yeah, see, I and, I, I was gonna say I, f- I feel like I got this the sense that you're a Warhammer fan because you, you, very you, very you, you casual. It, yeah. Well, well, just the fact yeah. you called it Warhammer Forty Thousand, not Forty uh, K. I guess it, that might be a tip off. I don't know if in the the Warhammer fandom, if that's like a, a thing to like differentiate, because I've only well, ever well, heard it Warhammer, called 40k. Well, there's Warhammer Fantasy, and then there's Warhammer 40,000. Well, yeah, because yeah, Warhammer is like, you know, typical like fantasy fantasy, and then 40k yeah. is the insane future space stuff with space orcs and yeah, and space elves. Yeah, I have like a it's... tertiary knowledge of uh, Warhammer. I've dipped into like a couple of the Space Marine novels. So, yeah, so I I haven't read many. I read a couple of the Horus Heresy novels. Like I've listened to them on, um, on like audiobook. But uh, I've never played the tabletop game. But I was me and my friends played the Dawn of War games a lot, and the Space Marine uh, game was fun as well. 
And they recently announced Space Marine 2 out of the blue, which was nice. It was like a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Yeah, that's the, probably the only uh, Warhammer game I played, the Space Marine. Very recently, a lot of fun. Yeah, just lots of killing walks. Yeah, but I'm I'm very very casual in the uh, Warhammer fandom. I mammoth franchise there is like a lot of lore. Or... Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff and I've, lots of deep stuff. But I've not delved down that rabbit hole. My friends are really into it. I'm just like, hey, Space Marines look cool. Death Corps of Krieg, yeah, that's a that's a good <laughs> Imperial Guard regiment. Yeah, I have a yeah. My my knowledge is very tertiary. Um, uh, you mentioned it earlier. Um, with with Armada, but I I love Star Wars Armada. I if um my my mother asked me one time, um, how much do those things cost? And I'm like, if I told you, you'd hate me. So, I uh yeah I that's a a big thing I'm into. And so whenever I go to the um, we have a a local uh, tabletops game shop uh mm -hmm. um in uh Fargo where I live and. I'll see people playing it, and I'm like, that looks really cool, but just the fact I would have to paint the miniatures, I have the artistic ability now, as I did in kindergarten, so um, <laughs> painting a miniature, I know, would probably just cause me to throw it on the floor and my cat would eat it or something. Yeah, I mean, I bought some Star Wars Legion snow troopers like a year or two ago, and I thought, oh, I could start with these and learn how to paint and i just never got around to it yeah i i have a i have a buddy who i, I have three friends of mine that are into legion and i'll play with them uh when, whenever we we'll get together and have disgusting sweaty nerd afternoons where we just drink beer and play with our grown-up adult toys and and i'm i Apparently, I think their stuff is amazing, but apparently in the realms of actual miniature paintings, it's like amateur hour, and I'm like, oh, so I definitely can't get into this. <laughs> but the game itself is amazingly fun. It's a great way to kill like two hours of time, and then... I'd, I'd love to actually, you know, get in and get into Armada and collect the models, but I have nobody to play with, and I'm not really interested in making new friends where I live. Oh, the, the worst part about it was... Um, I, I basically for well I, I I live with my brother and I basically forced him to play with me because I bought the Empire and Rebellion stuff I would I would, I, I have like all, I believe almost everything that came out so it's like I will bring I have um, two craftsman toolboxes that I got at the hardware store to transport my stuff and I'll I'll just bring it and I just just tell people I'm like okay we're going to play this miniature game of spaceships. <laughs> and fortunately my my nerdy friends oblige and so yeah my friends are like my friends that aren't online aren't really into that stuff if i could hang out with my online friends in real life a lot more than i have uh you know that's something we could do but we don't i've met all my online friends at least once mm. in person there isn't like a video game version of the uh, Armada game. There's I mean, um, Empire at War. <laughs> yeah, Empire at War. I believe there's essentially uh, one of my friends was telling me about it. It's uh, essentially a simulator that you can do, but it, it sounded too complicated, and I didn't feel like downloading yeah, it on my computer. Tabletop, tabletop simulator. Yeah, yeah, and I, I believe yeah. they have Armada and stuff on there. Well, yeah, that's what we did our RPG right, with. We right. used we just used the Armada as representation, Armada pieces as representations of our ships. Yeah, no, it worked uh, super well. Un un unfortunately, um, that's very lucky of you. I have I have yet to unfortunately make the journey from North Dakota to Texas to to meet with Keith and. At, at this time no, that's, vice, a, that's a long uh, way away versa. yeah it, it's literally the opposite end of like as far away as you can get i'm god i'm like three hours from the canadian border so <laughs> which I yeah, and i'm like four or five hours from the mexican border yeah, there so. you go we'll have to meet in the middle in kansas in a cornfield or something yes that sounds terrible some it random is. cornfield. Well, I, I've been to Iowa, and Iowa, and no offense to any Iowa listeners, but yeah, Iowa's basically the same as Kansas, and Iowa was awful. So, 
Nice. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's uh, that's. I mean, that's essentially Keith. Unless you have anything else to add to this lovely line of questioning and interrogation we've been doing. Uh, I don't know. I think we've gotten all the nitty gritty. Yeah. Perfecto. The nitty gritty, uh, nitty, nitty gritty dirt band here. But uh, yeah, no. If you um. I guess to kind of close out, uh, if, if you're not, if you're a listener of this and you somehow aren't aware of uh, Tad's channel, Manda Dash Lore, it, it's a great channel. Um, I was, I forgot to chime in earlier, but uh, one of the things I appreciate of of your lore videos is you're not just reading off of Wikipedia in a very obvious way. No, <laughs> yeah, I I do intensive amounts of research, and <laughs> luckily. With the internet, I'm able to find a lot more of the obscure, like, comics and, um, uh, West End games, stories, and stuff like that. So, I put in my effort to actually read the sources, because I honestly don't trust Wikipedia. No, People I, uh... can just change whatever, and half the dates on there for, like, battles and events are completely inaccurate. Oh yeah, I mean to to plug a uh, a video I did earlier where I I debunked a bunch of stuff. I have a video on Gray Jedi, and I just rip into that that Wikipedia page because it's awful and very clearly, oh, yeah. Wikipedia sometimes sometimes it's like dead on balls accurate, and other times it like straddles the line of like fanon and canon. It depends who wrote the article and when it was written. Yeah, that that's a very good point, and obviously. It just how it's gonna be, you know. It's it's you know that's why Wikipedia isn't supposed to be a source when you're in college. No, I I use it to 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 find sources. And and that's but... that is a great way to find it. I love the fact that all of the appearances are listed in in universe chronological order. So that's definitely it. Mm -hmm. It's a great resource to find things. But yeah, you know when someone come you know someone comments on a YouTube video and they're like, oh, great Jedi or this, and I'm like. Mm. No, they're not. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, no. it definitely shows that you put in that extra effort. Because uh, I remember, uh, in, the, in your uh, you know Clone Wars, TCW versus like the O three Clone Wars thing, you brought up this really cool part where the clone troopers are on Hanager fighting the Nogri. Yeah, such a just a really cool just like reference to you know heir to the Empire and all that. Uh, I like I liked the whole thing where like the troopers were doing like this maneuver where they run away and like last man in line stops and like holds off the nagri then they just keep doing that right pretty pretty grim stuff yeah it, well, like we were saying earlier you, you know that's when all of these different eras were finally coming together and we could you know you can explore things that were touched on in the you know post return of the jedi era but weren't ever like you know explored in the movies it doesn't feel like force awakens like you know here's the thing from before that, that you saw before it's you know it's integrated very well into the yeah story. it's like we, we got to show the devastation like see the devastation of Honiger and how the nogri reacted and like why the republic didn't do anything about it until after the war yeah, that fabled uh you know battle in the sky that they talk about in the books mm -hmm. yeah. but yeah um yeah to put this uh long minnesota goodbye to rest if you if you haven't subscribed or are currently watching uh tad's channel mandalore give it a check he you know like we just talked about he he does his research he's knows what he's talking about so he is uh lore council approved lore council approved yes and Yay. uh I just want to say thank you for coming on and doing this and just taking the time. Uh, we really oh. appreciate it. Oh, yeah. We, we thank definitely you for having me. I, oh, love, I love doing, like, little podcasts and just the chance for me to just blab about things that I like, you know? Oh, yeah. That's, I'll never that's, say no. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you like to blab, yeah. Yeah, that's literally how this all started, so. Yep. So, so yeah. Yeah, if, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, we... We are all the better for it, and if you've enjoyed this or um, 
any other content that we've uh, put out on the Lore Council channel, um, obviously we're trying to grow the channel, and a like and a subscribe goes a long way, and we really appreciate it. So this has been Cade from the Lore Council, signing off. This is Keith. If you need a podcast to listen to while you brush your teeth, think the Lore Council. Ad Larkin out.